Let's move on to shares of Charles Schwab posting deeper losses in the broader financials today, dropping more than 3%. The stock is down more than 40% in the last three months. But our next guest is bullish on Schwab, saying investors are mistaking a temporary problem for a permanent trend. Harris Associates partner and director of U.S. research, Alex Fitch, joins us now. Alex manages two Oakmark funds that own Schwab. Alex, thanks so much for joining us. Um, you're not the only one on the street who likes Schwab. There's a uh, there's a lot of most of the street actually like Schwab got a buy or an overweight rating on, on this one. It trades horribly, though. So what is what's the street thinking about this um, it, it, compared to what investors are thinking? Because it, it seems like investors are painting with the same brush as an SVB, like there's some sort of mark to market problem uh, lurking in Schwab's balance sheet. Yeah, I think we agree it trades horribly. Uh, it's a wonderful business that we think deserves a premium multiple and uh, on our uh, forecast of mid-cycle earnings, it trades at a high single-digit multiple of its earnings power. I think the big problem is that you do have a little bit of a mark-to-market issue, and you've had deposit outflows, and those are commonalities you really don't want to have today. Uh, I think they're very different for Schwab. Um, you know, Schwab is having deposit outflows because customers are moving funds from their bank to money market funds. That's exactly what you'd expect to see in a world with a 5% Fed funds rate. And I think a lot of investors don't appreciate that if First Republic customers move their accounts to J.P. Morgan or Bank of America and they've upended that relationship, that account is not coming back. That's very different than what's going on with Schwab customers, where you have a Schwab account, you buy a money market fund in the account, that customer is not gone, that money's not gone, and you've actually been seeing Schwab growing their accounts faster than they were before the banking crisis. So I think there's a different profile to the deposit flows that, that really matters. So the deposits are still stored or housed within the Charles Schwab complex. It's just in a different bucket. But when you say it's a, there's a little mark-to-market problem, can you explain that so we can understand what this, why it's a little problem and not a big problem or a problem can, that can get worse uh, if interest rates continue to rise? Sure. So Schwab has mark-to-market losses, not to the extent of Silicon Valley or First Republic, not even close, but they do have mark-to-market losses. The reason I say it's a little problem and, and not a big problem is you really can't look at just one side of the balance sheet and market. I mean, if you mark-to-market the assets, you also would want to mark-to-market the liabilities. In Silicon Valley's case, those turned out to be short duration. Uh, in Charles Schwab's case, we think they're very likely to be very long duration deposits. And so the equity value there is greater than it looks like if you just mark the securities. Um, quick one, though. Um, so they have plenty of cash on the balance sheet. And, and to your point about how you're marketing the assets and liabilities, I mean, the stock, to use Mel's technical term, does trade horribly. And, and it trades <laughs> like um, the company has to raise capital. Um, you know, and we've seen a lot of instances over the last couple of months where companies have come out and said they need to raise capital. We've seen what happened to their equity here. To me, closing very near a two-year low, I mean, what, what is your sense? Like, does, does this company, would it benefit them to raise capital and kind of put that to bed? Because if it's the sort of franchise that I think we all know it to be, wouldn't that be something that could actually maybe put a bottom into some of, like, we wouldn't be having this segment with you right now if maybe, like, we felt very comfortable about that capital base. Understood. I do not think they have to raise capital. They have materially above their regulatory minimums in capital today. And the only way that changes uh, is if the rules change around mark to market. And that is certainly on the table, but with a time delay. And one thing I think isn't appreciated about Schwab, when you earn two and a half or three times the return on equity of most of your most of the banks out there, you also fill a capital hole through earnings two and a half to three times faster. And so to the extent that there is some type of look through on this mark to market, I think Schwab's much better off filling the hole organically and has a much better ability to do so than most of the banks that we talk about today. It's Karen, thanks for being on. So when you think about valuing this stock, how do you value the different parts of the business? Where do you think they should trade in a, if, if we get sort of through this crisis and calm is restored? The way we see it, it's a brokerage business that decides to monetize uh, through bank deposits, essentially. And I agree with uh, one of the points made earlier that there is a headwind to the business and to the earnings profile in the next few years because you're losing deposits and you have to use higher cost funding to fill that hole. It's not a permanent headwind to the earnings profile. And 
eventually, when you get down to that frictional deposit base that is just cash between accounts and deposits grow again, you're going to replace all that high cost funding and you're going to get back to being this bank that has five to six dollars of mid cycle earnings power. And in our opinion, it's worth a above market multiple of that. And the two funds that you manage, Alex, did you have you increased your allocation to Charles Schwab with the we decline? Have, it was a new position in the Oakmark Select Fund uh, during this quarter, actually, and we increased it in Oakmark Equity and Income.